Once you've finished coding an application, you need to test it carefully to make sure that it behaves properly when it's in use. Even a relatively simple application, like this temperature units converter, might contain errors. So I need to make absolutely sure that it's going to work as intended. Before I go ahead and test it, let's consider the three main types of error an application might contain. There are syntax errors, runtime errors, and logic errors. A syntax error is one in which the programmer breaks the rules of the programming language. In C Sharp, this could mean that you've forgotten to type a double quote, or a curly bracket, or maybe a semicolon. Maybe you've used two equal signs instead of one, or perhaps you've simply spelt a command incorrectly. Syntax errors are not a big problem if you're using an integrated development environment like Visual Studio. The IDE will highlight nearly all of them while you're coding, and it'll even offer you advice on how to fix them. In fact, if you try to run a program that contains a syntax error, you'll see a build error message, and your program won't even compile until you deal with it. Just keep an eye out for the red squiggly line. A runtime error is an error which interrupts the normal flow of a program. Another name for a runtime error is an exception. With a runtime error, your application may well compile and start normally. It might even behave itself for a while, but then something will cause it to crash. For example, if a program tries to assign a string to a numeric variable, it will trigger a format exception. That's why you should take steps to validate any input data, as I've done here. There are several other types of exception that you will no doubt meet as you learn to code. Division by zero, file not found, index out of range, and stack overflow, to name but a few. Some of these exceptions you can predict and prevent by validating the input, but some you can't. In another lesson, you'll meet the try-catch block, which can be used to handle runtime errors that you've anticipated and those that you haven't. Arguably, the most insidious type of error is the logic error. A logic error won't prevent your program from running, and it might not cause it to crash, but it will cause your program to output the wrong results. Logic errors can be very difficult to spot. In fact, the only way to be sure that you've tracked them all down is by thoroughly testing your finished application. I've been testing and fixing this application regularly while I've been writing the code, so-called iterative testing. The testing I've done so far is also called white box or glass box testing, because I can see inside the application, as it were. I can see the code. But iterative glass box testing is usually not enough. Now that the application is complete, I should do a full final test, so-called terminal testing. To help ensure that I do it thoroughly, I've written a test plan. In fact, test planning is another important aspect of defensive design. In my test plan, I've included a range of input data, some valid and some invalid. And, for each value that will be input, I've used a spreadsheet to calculate what the output should be. When I run each of these tests, I'll compare the actual output with the expected output, and I'll record pass or fail. I've also included a column to make any comments that I think will help. The final testing could be performed by a non-programmer. You don't need to see or understand the code to work your way through this test plan. For that reason, this type of testing is often referred to as black box testing. So, with the test plan in front of me, I'm going to run through it, one test at a time. First, the length check. The actual result is exactly what was expected. Having said that, the error message isn't particularly friendly. An error message should give the user some guidance as to what to do next, so perhaps it should be changed. 
please enter 10 or fewer digits. Not selecting a radio button, this is, strictly speaking, a presence check. Please select Fahrenheit or Celsius. That looks good. Another pass. Now, with Fahrenheit selected, I'm going to leave the text box empty. This is another presence check. As expected. Now for a type check. A range check. And so on. This seems to be working as expected, but there are far too many digits on display there. Time for another comment, I think. And that's working as expected, but again, I'm not so sure about the error message. The assumption here is that the user knows what absolute zero in Fahrenheit actually is. Notice that when I dismiss one of these error messages, other things do happen. The text box has been cleared and my cursor has been put in position. I should really have included that in the expected result, if I want to be thorough. Well, everything seems fine so far, and it's tempting to stop testing. But it's imperative that you do this exhaustively. I'm now going to check the Celsius to Fahrenheit conversions. With the Celsius radio button selected, everything seems fine so far. But there is a big problem. A hundred degrees Celsius, the boiling point of water, in Fahrenheit is 212. This hasn't worked at all. Let's continue. The freezing point of water in Fahrenheit is certainly not zero. It looks like whatever I type in is what's coming out. There's no conversion taking place at all. I'm going to have to fix this. Let's continue. So let's see if we can figure out what's gone wrong. This is the section of code which is performing the calculation when I want to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit. I've just realised as well that absolute zero in Celsius is not minus 275. It's more like minus 273. So I'm going to fix that while I'm here. This is where I'm taking the temperature in Celsius and converting it into Fahrenheit. I copied and pasted the code for the Fahrenheit to Celsius conversion, which you can see here. And then I just made a few changes to the names of the variables. That looks OK. But you can see there's a problem when I output the result. I'm not outputting the converted value, I'm outputting the original value. This is an easy fix, but it's had a devastating effect on the way my application works. Let's tidy up some of those error messages as well. And finally, I want to make sure that the output is always displayed with two decimal places at the most. I can do that using two string. Now I'm going to do a very quick check.
and it seems to be okay now. But strictly speaking, I should rewrite my test plan because I've got some new messages, and I should run through all of those tests from the top again. By fixing just one bug, I may well have introduced others.